beings. A third student, student spoke up and said, we are all human beings. What did the duck say when he bought lipstick? Just put it on my bill. Oh, all right, all right. That's enough of that. So, uh, well, we are glad you're here. We know you could go other places to worship today. And uh, we're excited about the opportunity to share the Word of God with you. Today we're going to finish the section we've been on probably two months. I know some of you are just coming back. You were here a year ago. Guess what? I'm still in the book of Romans. This is the 197th lesson in the book of Romans. And uh, we're in the 14th chapter. In fact, we're going to close the 14th chapter this morning. And we're going to finish these principles that we've been speaking about in the idea of building up one another in the church without offending each other. And we've looked at five principles so far. You see them up there on the, on the screen. Uh, not wanting to cause a brother to stumble. Not causing a brother or sister to grieve. Certainly not devastating a brother. Never offending a brother in any way so as to forfeit our witness to ourselves and each other in the world. And then the last time we, we were together and discussed this, we talked about not pulling down the work of God. And when we speak of the work, remember when we speak of not pulling down the work of God, who are we talking about? We're talking about each other, okay? We're talking about brothers and sisters in the Lord. So, uh, uh, and today then, we're, not, we're going to speak, we're going to close out this section with a very simple, uh, just a couple verses on about speaking about not flaunting your leadership. Don't be prideful, uh, don't be prideful in how you exhibit your liberty would be a better way for me to speak about it. So uh, a simple point, but still a rich point. So uh, turn with me to Romans 14. Romans 14, verses 22 and 23. And if you're ready for the word of God this morning, would you signify that by saying amen? amen. And would you please stand with me and, uh, out of respect for the reading of the word of God? In Romans 14, 22 and 23, it says, Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats. Because if he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. And just join with me for a second. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we... Uh, we come to you this morning, Lord. Uh, you struck me this morning, Lord, and how uh, it's really, your, your, your word can be so difficult for us, Lord, uh, when we try to understand it within ourselves. But Lord, when we allow your spirit to act on our hearts, to act on our minds, then Lord, you have great revelation for us. Lord, it's my prayer this morning that we wouldn't uh, focus on the vessel that's being used to teach and preach your word, that we would focus on the word. And in that, Lord, we can take uh, great comfort that we know you're with us by your spirit that indwells us. So, Father, just be with us in a special way today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. So in verse 22, Paul writes, he says, Do you have faith? I've got so, many, so much stuff up here, I can't, I can't put anything in here. Do you have faith, okay? Have it yourself, he says, before God. Kind of an unusual phrase. And then happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Now, let's, what, let's follow Paul's train of thought here. He's, set, he's wrapping up this section of scripture, and he makes this point here. Do you have faith? And when he says, do you have faith, who's he speaking to? We've been talking about strong, strong brothers in the Lord and weak brothers in the Lord. And when he says, do you have faith, he's speaking to the strong brother in the Lord. He's speaking to the one who believes that they have freedoms. He's speaking to one who has a legitimacy in the freedoms in their Christian walk. He's saying, do you understand your liberties? And if so... 
then if you understand your liberties, you have a freedom before God. And I want you to enjoy your freedoms, but listen. What he says, I want you to enjoy it between you and the Lord himself. Don't go around flaunting your liberty, all right? Have a great time with your liberty, but don't go around and put it in other people's faces. It's like, Lord, I, I'm free in the liberties that you've given me. I'm not, I'm not held back by any taboos or any traditions or any legalistic thought. I'm absolutely free. I'm free of those things that were, that were constrained under the, old, uh, under the old covenant. I'm free, and in that freedom, Lord... I want to be all I can in and by you, but I want to keep that. Paul says you want to keep that between you and God, okay? He's, 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 he's saying that by keeping it between you and the Lord, you will have no reason to self-condemn yourself because of your flaunting it in, in, other people's, uh, in front of other people. And because you keep it between you and God, you won't have a guilty conscience about it. Because there will be no reason for guilt in your walk. You won't, you won't, you won't have a guilty conscience about it because you will not have caused your brother or sister to stumble in the Lord. So what he says is, in, listen to me, if you're a, br a strong brother and sister in the Lord, enjoy your liberty, but enjoy it between you and God. Don't force someone who doesn't have the same freedoms you have to live up to your expectation, okay? Don't flaunt those things in front of them. Don't cause them to stumble. Don't devastate a believer. All the things that he's already said, stay away from those things. But then he says in verse 23, you know, Paul's very systematic in his teaching. He speaks to the strong believer. In verse 23, who does he speak to? The weak believer, in verse 23, he says, but he who doubts. That's the way Paul describes a weak Christian, a weak believer. He who doubts, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats. Because, and what does eat mean? I've taught you that. When you write, see that word eat, you can write in the word freedom. Okay? Is condemned if he eats. He's condemned if he exercises his freedom, but he does not have freedom from his faith, okay? He doesn't have freedom from his faith. In other words, he see. okay, I saw Pastor Medeiros do this, so that means it's okay for me to do it. First of all, you don't want to do everything I do, okay? Because I ain't perfect. So you don't want to do everything I do. But if, you, if your conscience, in your Christian walk today, if your conscience says that what I'm doing is wrong, don't do it. Because what you do is you impact your conscience to a point where you sear it over. It talks about it in, in Timothy, where you sear over your conscience. And the, your conscience is part of how the Spirit speaks to you on a daily basis. So you have to be careful of that. Don't, don't try it. Listen, and remember... Weak and strong Christians are weak and strong in different things. I might be strong in this and weak in something else. Paul evidently thought this was an important thing. If you go through, get a Thompson chain. Any of you have a Thompson chain reference Bible? Yeah. Get a Tom, Thompson uh, chain reference Bible and see what it says about liberty. How many places Paul talks about liberty. This is a very important thing to Paul. And what he says to the weak Christian is don't try to be like the strong. Until you believe that you're really, if, until you believe that what you're going to do is right. Because if you do it and you don't believe it's right, what is it? What's he say? It's a sin. He says it right there at the end of that verse. It's a sin. And you don't want to, you don't want to self condemn. So, how are you going to, if you're a strong Christian today, if you have areas of strength in your walk, how are you going to be happy? Well, what Paul says, I'll tell you how. He says, set your liberty aside in front of other people and enjoy your freedom between you and the Lord. Enjoy it. Have a good time with it. And, and if you do that, 
You won't have to worry about hurting anybody else, and you'll actually be happier. Verse 22, if you don't condemn yourself for the things that you're doing that are causing other people problems. And if you're a weak believer today, if you want to be happy, don't think you can eat what you want to eat if you don't think you should be eating it. And by eating, remember, I mean your freedoms. Don't do that because when you do that, you go against your conscience and you will consider yourself having been a sin. Let's say, I'm thinking of an example. I don't want to get anybody, I don't want, I, I don't want to offend anybody. Let's say you see me at Galliano's and I'm drinking a glass of wine. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I tell you, uh, where, I, where I was, the church I was saved at, that would be, that would be the pox. P-A-U-X. That would be a bad, bad thing. But let's say, and most of you know, I'm a, I was once an alcoholic. I've, had, I've been given freedom from alcoholism. Because that's what God does. God gives you freedom from things. He gives you victory over things. And that's why so many Christians live non-victorious lives. Because they've convinced themselves some way, shape, or form that God cannot give you victory over things. I don't, I don't understand that m mentality, and it's why they're so oftentimes so beleaguered. But, and you won't see me at Galliano drinking wine, incidentally, but if you were to see me, and that was, that was something in your walk that you thought is a sin, if you see me doing that, I'm going to have an adverse impact upon you. So why in the world would I ever do that? Why would I ever do that? Why would I subject you to what I think is right when you don't think it's right? Because listen to me, and you know one of the world weaknesses of the church today is, is that we don't consider each other before we consider ourselves. Before I want to exercise my freedom, I need to think about everybody that I impact all the time. Before you have something negative to say about a brother or sister in the Lord, why don't you think a negative thought about yourself? So I really get tired. How often do I hear people say edifying things about each other compared to how often do I hear people say negative things about each other? And yet, this was an, a uniquely important issue for Paul. He, the Holy Spirit moved him to write this whole section of Scripture about the exercising of freedom by the strong Christian and the impact that it has on the weak Christian. Strong Christian, enjoy yourself between you and the Lord, but don't abuse your freedoms, okay? Okay, so that, that really closes up that 14th chapter. And we're going to, and, and what we're looking at is an overarching theme here, okay? First, we looked at how we receive each other. And then this section we've just finished, we've looked at how we, uh, how we build each other without offending each other in whatever we do. Okay? And if you wanted to encapsulate these thoughts, all you would have to do is go to 1 Corinthians 10. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 31 and 32, there, Paul writes, here you go. If you want... If you want to, you can, you can take all the, uh, the last ten sermons I've, I've, I've taught on this subject matter. Just take these two verses. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to what? To the glory of God. So as you do it, as you do it, when you do it, before you do it, 
<laughs> hopefully, say, am I doing this to God's glory? Is this, glory? is this glorifying God? And then verse 32, Paul says, give no offense. And he says, either to the Jew, he's speaking about unsaved Jews, or to the Greeks, he's talking about unsaved Gentiles, when he uses that word Greeks, or to who else? To the church of God. Don't offend the unsaved Jew. Don't offend the unsaved Gentile. And don't offend each other. In other words, what Paul says is don't offend anybody. And if you go to the next verse in 33, he says, Just as I also please. Who does Paul please? All men. And how does he please all men? In all things. Not seeking my own profit, but what? The profit of many. And then the most important part is the last five or so words of the verse. He says, I want to profit many that they might be saved. That's why you got, you got to treat each other properly. Because when people look at churches and they see mean, grumpy Christians out in, the, out in the community, they say, what in the world do I want to do with those folks? Because they're mean and grumpy. I can get that anywhere. I can go to the, uh, the, I'm not, uh, the VFW. I used to be a member of the VFW. <laughs> I can go to the Eagles, I can go to the Lions, I can go to the Ducks, I can go to any of those groups, the little baby birds, otherwise known as quails. I can go to any of those groups and get the same thing. But see, when you treat each other with the love of Christ, it's a people magnet. It's like a, what's that thing? On the, the swifter, a duster, a duster. It's a, people, it's, a, it's a people magnet. It draws people. And that's the ultimate goal of unity in the church between strong and weak believers because it becomes a profound testimony to the world about who we are when we love each other. And in that love for each, for each other, it speaks to pe people about our salvation and it draws them to salvation. And that is a big, big thing. People's salvation. That's who we're to be about, okay? So, chapter 15. Chapter 15 of Romans. And we're, you know, we're getting close to finishing the book of Romans, and then I'm going to start teaching the, the gospel of John. And, and even though we're getting close to the end of Romans, it's still got a lot of great, uh, rich truth for us. And we're going to look at the first seven verses in Romans as we begin this next section uh, and it's really the last part of this uh, idea of unity of strong and weak believers. But let me say this, and I'll only get through the introduction this morning. Uh, this last section, it speaks about Paul re-emphasizes the need for unity in the church. See, it's obvious to all of us that chaos, confusion, strife, Envy, jealousy, anger, bitterness, dissension, infighting, hatred, indifference to the needs of others, selfishness, a lack of sacrificial love, all of those things, it's obvious to us, violate the idea of unity of the church. And if they violate the idea of unity of the church, we know they violate the will of God. And when the will of God is violated in the church, what happens is it cripples the testimony of the church to the world. Listen, we have a very loving church. Do you believe that? We could be more loving. Do you believe that? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, the loving harmony and unity of the church has been, continues to be, and will always be a grave concern to God. Did you know that? Let me point that out to you as we begin this last section of Scripture by way of introduction to this last section. First of all, let me say that the unity of the church is a prime concern to God, 
the Father. Okay? The unity of the church is a concern to God the Father. And by way of background, Psalm 133, a very, a very brief psalm, three verses, uh, it says this. It says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down to the edge of his garments. In other words, it's like a sweet, fragrant, beautiful, lovely perfume like the dew of Hermon. Speaking of the, the, de, the, the glistening dew on the mountains in the morning. You see, though, you know, when we go out, Gary and I go golfing on Friday, we go out to the golf course, seems like we always have to wait an hour before we play. The, as the golf, as the course begins to warm up, you see the dew on the grass. And then in verse 3, it's like, he says, it's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The idea of unity in the body of Christ. Jeremiah 32, okay? The unit, listen, if you, if you th just think about what I read in Psalm 133, it said that the unity of God's people is a sweet and fragrant perfume to him. Did you know that? What do you think the disunity is like? Psalm, Jeremiah 32, another reference. Just a couple of verses in Jeremiah 32. It deals with a new covenant. In Jeremiah 32, uh, 38, it says, and God speaks concerning the people who someday will partake of the new covenant. He says, they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Verse 39. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forevermore for the good of them and their children after that. I love that idea. I will give them one heart and one way. One heart, one way. What's the heart? I will give you all one internal attitude. That's your heart. And I'm going to point you down one external pathway, one way. The heart and the way you go will all be in accord when you seek unity in the way that God desires for us to seek unity. And then just one other Old Testament text referring to how God desires our unity. Ezekiel chapter 37. Most of you are familiar with Ezekiel 37. It begins with the vision of the valley of the dry bones. Okay? The valley of the dry bones. A picture of God regathering the nation Israel uh, in final salvation. But I want you to notice that as the Lord looks ahead to the future glory of his redeemed people, Israel, beginning in verse 15, the, way, the word of the Lord comes to the prophet, and in verse 16 he says, As for you, son of man, he says, take a stick for yourself and write on it. And that stick is for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then take the two sticks, and what do you do with them? You make them into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. Now, Ezekiel carried out a lot of object lessons in his ministry. But this is a pretty unique one right here. God says, take one stick, and you identify it with Judah. What's Judah? It's the southern kingdom. Take another stick and identify it as Israel, also called Ephraim, for the son of Joseph, who became the leader of the nations of the northern kingdom, and identify it as Israel. Those two sticks then represent what? The divided kingdom, okay? It was divided under Jeroboam. And take them, and he says, and put them together and make them one stick in your hand because that's the way one day it's going to be. One day... They will be joined together. Someday God is going to take his divided kingdom and he's going to bring it back together in final glory. So, and you know, remember who Ezekiel is speaking to. Is this a foreign subject to the people that, are, that he's speaking to? No. 
Because in number 17, it talks about, in verse 2, every tribe of, 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 the, of God's chosen people had a stick. They all had their own unique stick. And that stick was to identify them. And here God simply takes that same idea and he talks about them being joined together as if to say that the day will come when God, God will join his people as one people again. That's what's going to happen in the future. Now in these prophecies we see that God has intended through his new covenant and ultimately through his design with the nation Israel to bring them back together as one people. It is the same then for the church of God. Just as, it, as with the nature, just as with the future of the nation Israel, all the rebels one day will be purged out and Israel will become one. Okay? Israel will become one. They will have the same heart. They will have the same way. And in John 10, 14, Jesus said, he said, I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. Okay? I am known by my own, he says. That is, they know me as well. And then in verse 15, he says, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. And then he says, And other sheep that, I have not, that are not of this fold. Other sheep, okay? Who are the other sheep? That's the Gentile word. Their world. They're not, they're not Jews. But I lay by, down my life for them. And Jesus continues, them also I must bring and they will hear my voice. And there will be one fold and one shepherd. And therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life. In other words, God's purpose was that Christ laid down his life to redeem, to redeem the Jew and the Gentile and to make them into one people. That's de God's desire today. God's desire was to make us all one. The nation of Israel that had been fragmented, God was de desires that become a redeemed nation of, of one. And the, the redeemed church, God has a desire that the redeemed church function in perfect, perfect, perfect unity. And the, the big problem with the church today is, is that it does not function in the unity in which it once functioned in the first century. Because today it's fragmented because we all got our own deal. And we all want to do our own deal. And we want to set our own priorities. And we want what we want to be important to be important. But there's only one thing that's important. That's the word of God. 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 15, 28, you find the consummation of this idea. It says, now when all things are made subject to him, that is to Jesus Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to him, to his Father, who put all things under him, God put all things under Christ, that God may be all in all. Everything. Okay? Then, then shall the Son himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. In other words, everything, everything ultimately will resolve in a great, glorious, eternal unity under God. Listen, folks. There will be no dissension in heaven. You don't get your opinion. You don't get your way. Okay? And what we're supposed to be doing now is emulating that. Okay? That's why it's important for you to look at me and make sure that what I tell you is correct, is it not? Check what I say. So what we gain from just looking at those few scriptures briefly is that the unity, it is the desire of God's God that his people, whether they be his covenant people Israel or his new covenant people the church, whether they be a Jew or a Gentile, whether we're talking about the past, the present, or the future millennial kingdom, it's God's desire that his people be one people, with one heart, with one voice, and with one consent to the way and the will of God, and who worship one God, 
who is known by one name. Okay? The unity of the redeemed is indeed the purpose of God. And that purpose, of course, ultimately finds its consummation in our ultimate glory. You know, that's why I I don't believe in pastor-led churches. I think that gets pastors in trouble. I believe it gets, I think, believe it gets uh, congregations in trouble. That's why I believe the Word of God teaches us that we're to be elder-led, a group of men that God leads to lead the church who are all co-equal in their authority. You know, you look at me and you think, well, he's the boss. I ain't no boss. I'm just a figurehead. I'm the talker. I'm not any more devout. I'm not any more holy than any of the other men that are elders of the church. I'm just gifted in this particular way. Revelation 21, 1 through, 1 through 4 speaks about this idea of unity. Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth they had passed away. There was no more sea. Then I, I, John, saw the city, the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride is adorned for her husband. Think about that. As a bride is adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things. All of those things have now passed away. And there we have the idea. We, we, we see a glimpse of eternal glory. All people brought together under the kingship of God forever and ever. So, from all this then, we can gather. G- give me, give me, uh, give me the, give me the, the, the give me the, Uh, assent to the idea that it is important for God that his people be unified. Okay? Number one. Secondly, it's important. The unity of the church is not only the desire of God the Father. The unity of the church is also the desire of God the Son. And I think that's obvious. If you need to be reminded, John 17, 11... Jesus praying to the Father, Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. He's speaking of his apostles. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are, speaking about his apostles. And then in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone. I'm not only praying for my apostles right now, Father, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. They will profess me with their lips. I'm praying for them too. And what is he praying for them? He's praying that they will be one. That is not only, so he's praying for his disciples. He's praying for future disciples. He's praying in verse 21, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the, and then, okay, so if, they're, if we're all one, okay, that they all may be one in us, why? That the world may believe that you sent me. When we're all one, the world believes that God sent Jesus Christ because we're different. The, the Greek word is peculiar. We're peculiar people when we reflect the unity of Jesus Christ and we reflect that unity in reality. Remember, the main overriding emphasis in this group of Scripture is love. Do you love? Is your love evident for each other? So it's clear that what the, evidence, the emphasis here is. It is the... So it is the particular concern of God the Father that we be one. It is the particular concern of God the Son that be, we be one. And then finally, it's the particular concern of God the Holy Spirit that we be one. And, you know, we've been studying Acts for about 35 weeks now on Sunday nights. In Acts chapter 2, which we've already studied, I've got, th- I've got through chapter 2, we, we see that identified for us in verse 4. They're filled with the Spirit. And because of that, they're filled with the Spirit. And a movement of God takes place. Some wonderful things happen. And if you look at chapter 2, verse 28, Peter preaches. And a whole group of people are what? 
They're saved. And in verse 38, Peter says, he tells them, repent and be baptized that every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that results, well, in verse 41, it says there were added how many souls? 3,000 souls were baptized. Verse 42, and what did they do? Okay, here's the church. Here's the definition. This is the definition of the church. Ready? They continued stat steadfastly together in the apostles' doctrine. They studied the word of God. Okay? In fellowship. Oh, man, I don't like the fellowship. Oh, man, I don't like, I don't like that fellowship stuff. Fellowship is part of your Christian walk. It's an essential to your Christian walk. It says they broke bread together. That's why we eat every chance we get here. You've got to break bread. They prayed for each other. And then it says fear came on, many, on every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And, they all, and then watch this. It says they all, all that believed were together. And, they, and it says, they had all things in common. How can that be? How can a group of people? Now, how many people are we talking about? We're talking about 3,000 men. Then we're talking about their wives. Then we're talking about their children. And it says they had all things in common. How did that happen? You know how? Because they spent all their time together. Oh, we can't do that. We're too busy. I know you are. I know you are. It's evidence on Sunday nights. It's, I, I know you are. It's evidenced on Wednesday nights. You're too busy. The world's a busy place. It says that they were, they were together and they had all things in common. They were so in love with each other that they sold their possessions and goods and they were giving, they were giving them away to anyone that had need. Now, people have taken that to the extreme, and that's how you have, you've had the communal uh, movement in America. It's not what it means. It just means when people were in need. You know what? One thing, sometimes Christians worry about people outside the church, and they worry about the people in the church. Sorry, folks. Ain't supposed to be that way. Because your witness in the church is the witness to the people outside the church. Yes, you have to evangelize. Yes, you have to speak about God. But what you do in these walls here today, how you interact with each other, the way you love each other, according to Paul, is a witness to the world. And then back in Acts there in verse 46, they continued, it said, daily in one accord. They went from house to house breaking uh, bread. They, they ate their food with... They, were, they had gladness and they had a singleness of heart and so on. All these descriptive words, if you read that section, all these descriptive words. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit moved on these people on the day of Pentecost and it brought them into unity, just as the church is supposed to be in unity today, okay? They were within one doctrine, one proclamation. They were sharing everything they had with each other. And you can go to Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Same idea, okay? I'm not going to belabor the fact. But I am going to belabor this fact. The picture here is, is, is that, listen, you and I, we are not only one in terms of our union with the living God. We are. We are not only one in the terms of our new creation, we are. We are not only one in the terms of our redeemed nature, which we are. All of those things speak to our position. But listen, all of those things, our new creation, our redeemed nature, all of those things speak to an obvious implication. And it, that is that we also be one in practice, one in life, and one in sharing all that fellowship impels us to share. See, the only way the church of God can really be unified is when I know you. I have to know you. Okay? 
That's the fallacy of staying home. I have to know you. I have to have the opportunity. You're stealing from me when you don't fellowship with me. You don't give me the opportunity to know you. It's important. I don't know what percent. I don't know. I don't know. I know I've, I've meddled a lot this morning. I don't know what percent. Well. You know, all I know is what, what, this, what, this, what this, these words tell me. In Ephesians 4, Paul is writing in Ephesians 4, and he says, he tells the church in Ephesus, I, I believe he's, he would be considered to be speaking to the elders, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. See, one of the primary tasks in the life of the church is to maintain unity. It's called, in Scripture, it's called the unity of the Spirit. And that unity is the desire of our Father God, of our Father the Son, and of our Father the Holy Spirit. There is one body and one Spirit, and you are, we are called... When God called you, listen, when God called you to be a Christian, he had no idea in your mind that you, would, that you would stay home. And I'm not here to talk to you about attendance. I'm really not. I, you know, we do an attendance report every month. If you come, you come. If you don't, you don't. What I'm here to talk to you about is the unity of the church. Do you get that? That's really what I'm here to talk to you about. There is... Uh, there is, there, is, there, is one, there is one body, and that one body is called to be together. Even though, even though sometimes, I know sometimes you, you, know, you come to church and you say, man, I don't want to hear them today. Or maybe you see me on the street and you want to turn and t- walk the other way. I do have people in that town that do that. But they, most of them don't come to church here, just a few. But God wants us to be unified by our love for each other. And I just want to love you. And I want to be able to love you by knowing who and how you are. And if you look at this, this section in Ephesians 4, it talks about the Lord how the Lord is involved in our one faith, how our Father is involved in our one faith, how the Spirit is involved in our one faith. There's one God, there's one Lord, there's one Spirit, and the desire of all of them is that we maintain a unity of the Spirit and a bond of peace. And we should be, and that's why, that's my exhortation this morning. I'm supposed to be an exhorter, okay? That's what the Word of God says. I think that's the will of God, that people be united, all right? That his church be united in all things and in all ways. So I hope I haven't hurt you, your feelings in any way, shape, or form. It's just what the Lord laid on my heart to preach. So this morning then, in review, we finished the section on not offending each other. We looked at the last last principle, do we have faith, okay? Do we have faith? We don't want the strong believer to offend the weak believer. And then here in the 15th chapter, we've looked at the the introduction of pleasing. The the title of this section is Pleasing One Another, not not for my sake, Pleasing One Another for the sake of Christ. Because he's the one that died for us. Okay? So when we... If we'll acknowledge that the unity of the church is a concern of the Trinity, it should be a concern for us, correct? And that's not to say that we're we're disunified. I don't want all the people that came back today from, that are here, our winter folks that have just come back to think we're not unified. We're as unified as we've ever been. And you know what? We're as blessed as we've ever been. We've got a brand new roof. When When it all gets said and done, 
we've made money on a roof. The roof is worth more than we paid for the building. How does that work? That's the way God works. So those things work that way when, uh, when we are unified. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joy to work with men. Uh, you know, I often think of it. It's a joy to work with men that are so unified in their desire to glorify God. And uh, tell an elder besides me that you, that you love them and you appreciate them. Okay, let's all uh, let's stand. And we're going to have a time of invitation. Really, we don't call it a, 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 a time of invitation. We call it a call to follow Jesus. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, it's why not? <laughs> why would you not want to be part of this peculiar group? Uh, you know, the Word talks about... Uh, Jesus says that uh, a lot of people hear. The difference is who heeds the word. Who does the word actually, because the word is supposed to change. So we want to let the word change us today. In whatever way the Lord wants. Not necessarily in the way we want, but in ever, any way the Lord wants. So however, however that might work. Let's give it to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And Father, as we come to this time of a, a call to follow Christ, we, we just uh, give this time to you, Lord. It's our prayer, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that you'll touch their heart today. Maybe there needs to be an affirmation in their life of... Uh, of who and how you are. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they've accepted you as Savior and, but never been scripturally baptized. Uh, maybe they've never made a public profession of faith. I'm struck, Lord, that I really think that we need to do that. I think uh, your word implies that if we don't profess you before people, you won't profess us before your Father. So, Lord... Uh, Whatever the need might be in the area of salvation or professing or baptism, we just pray to you, Lord, that your spirit will move on hearts, uh, however that may work out. And then, Father, uh, whatever other need there might be, we have this burden box up here on the, on the top of the steps where people write things that they want to get out of their lives, and they place those burdens in that box, and then it's always our prayer, Lord, that they'll leave them there, that they won't take them back up. So, Lord, we, if somebody needs to place a note in that burden box, if somebody needs to kneel at the altar, give this time to you. Uh, lay, a, lay something at your feet, a prayer, a praise. If, if there's something that somebody needs to come forward and tell, how, tell the body how God has worked in their lives, whatever it might be, Lord, we, we give this time to you to work. And, Father, uh, if, I, if I can help, my prayer you'll allow me to do that if if we have ladies that need to speak to ladies we have ladies that do that and there's other elders here whatever the need might be today lord help us to be uh open to your leading father and father uh we don't we don't profess these things because uh we're uh men of great knowledge in fact lord uh we profess these things with humility we profess these things, Lord, as, 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 as those that have been taught to be, uh, to be a servant, to have a servant's mind and a servant's heart. So, Father, we, we give this time to you today. We, uh, we pray that you'll lose, use it as you desire. I pray for open hearts and open minds, Lord, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.